In The Groundwork, Kant said that we can conceive of nothing in this world that can be called good without qualification, except for a good will. For the talents of the mind, such as intelligence, wit, judgment, or the qualities of temperament, like courage, resolution, and perseverance, are undoubtedly good and desirable, but these gifts of nature may also become extremely bad and mischievous if the will which is to make use of them is not good. The same applies to other qualities, however they may be named, the gifts of fortune, power, riches, honor, even health, and the general well-being and contentment with one's condition, which we call happiness, end up only inspiring pride and often presumption if there cannot be found a good will within oneself. So he says, a good will is the indisputable condition even of being worthy of happiness. He goes further. Moderation in the affections and passions, self-control, and calm deliberation, although the ancients have so unconditionally praised them, they are also far from deserving to be called good without qualification, for without the principles of goodwill they may become extremely bad. The coolness of a villain, for instance, not only makes him far more dangerous, but also directly makes him more abominable in our eyes than he would have been without it. A good will, however, Kant says, is not good because of what it performs or affects, not by its aptness for the attainment of some proposed end, but simply by virtue of the volition. That is, it is good in itself, and considered by itself to be esteemed much higher than all that can be brought about by it in favor of any inclination, even of the sum total of all inclinations. It has its whole value in itself, so its usefulness or fruitfulness can neither add nor take away anything from its value. In discussing the absolute value of a mere will that doesn't take its utility into account, he states that there's something very strange about that view, for it may perhaps really be the product of a mere high-flown fancy, and that we may have misunderstood the purpose of nature in assigning reason as the governor of our will. In a being which has reason and a will, if the proper object of nature were its conservation, its welfare, in a word its happiness, then nature would have hit upon a very bad arrangement in selecting reason for the creature to carry out this purpose. All the action which the creature has performed with a view to this purpose, and the whole rule of its conduct, would be far more surely prescribed to it by instinct, and that end would have been attained thereby much more certainly than it would have ever been by reason. He writes, for as reason is competent to guide the will with certainty in regard to neither objects nor satisfaction of all our wants, which it, to some extent, even multiplies, this being an end to which an implanted instinct would have led to much greater certainty. And since, nevertheless, reason is imparted to us as a practical faculty, that is, as one which is to have influence on our will, admitting that nature generally in the distribution of her capacities has adapted the means to an end, its true destination must be to produce a will, not merely good as a means to something else, but good in itself, for which reason was absolutely necessary. In order to develop the notion of a will which deserves to be highly esteemed for itself, and a good without a view to anything further, he takes the notion of duty, which includes that of a good will, and gives an example of it. It is always a matter of duty for a dealer not to overcharge an inexperienced purchaser, However, even if the dealer thus served men with honesty, this is not enough to make us believe that the dealer has so acted from duty and from principles of honesty, for his own advantage requires it. And it is a duty to maintain one's life, and everyone also has a direct inclination to do so. But on this account, the often anxious care which most men take care of, for it has no intrinsic worth, and their maxim has no moral import. They preserve their life as duty requires, no doubt but not because duty requires. On the other hand, if adversity and hopeless sorrow have completely taken away the relish for life, if the unfortunate one, strong in mind, indignant at his fate rather than desponding or dejected, wishes for death and yet preserves his life without loving it, not from inclination or fear, but from duty, then his maxim has a moral worth. Kant says it is in this manner that we are to understand the passages of scripture in which we are commanded to love our neighbor and even our enemy, for it is beneficence for our duty's sake. As a result, he establishes his first point, 
that to have moral worth, an action must be done from duty. And he proceeds to lay out the second, that an action done from duty derives its moral worth not from the purpose which is to be attained by it, but by the maxim by which it is determined, and therefore does not depend on the realization of the object of the action, but merely on the principle of volition by which the action has taken place, without regard to any object of desire. Any unconditional or moral worth cannot be determined by the expected effects of the action, but by the principle of the will, and for the will stands between the a priori principle, which is formal, and its a posteriori spring, which is material. It has to be determined by the formal principle of volition when an action is done from duty. He presents his third proposition based on his two previous propositions. Duty is the necessity of acting from respect for the law. And he writes, I may have inclination for an object as the effect of my proposed action, but I cannot have respect for it, just for this reason, that it is an effect and not an energy of will. Similarly, I cannot have respect for inclination, whether my own or another's. I can at most, if my own approve it, if another sometimes even loves it, i.e., look on it as favorable to my own interest. Therefore, he concludes, since only the law itself can be an object of respect, and therefore a command, there remains nothing to determine the will except objectively the law, and subjectively pure respect for this practical law. Consequently, it is in this alone that the supreme and unconditional good quality of ours can be found.